Do you know which seat you're in? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on the left here. Okay. So I can use the... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to TAFAP Afternoons. I'm very excited. This is the first day of public programming at the fair. We had a coffee talk at 11. We had one panel at 2. And now we have this one at 4. I encourage you, please, to have a look at this and see what else is on for you, because I think there are many interesting things that you might like to attend. Um, this is such a fantastic treat. And I'm so glad you're here to be part of it. Um, we have the great honor of having a director of one of the great museums in the world with us today, and I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, and I had the chance to speak with him briefly at the V&A in London a few months ago, which was lovely, so we kind of know each other a tiny bit, um, just a tiny bit. Uh, but Thomas Marks, who is the editor of Apollo magazine, knows him a lot better, and I suspect that this is going to be an extremely interesting conversation. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, we're being live streamed on Facebook, and you can see it afterwards on Facebook or recommend it to your friends. And then uh, once we go through the final edit, it's up on the website permanently. Okay? So thank you so very much for being here. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Linda. And thanks for that introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to, to be here with uh, Tristram Hunt, um, and we'll introduce him in a minute. He tells me his real reason for being in New York is that he's going to the Met Gala on I Monday. And I said, he's, he, he's, he's not going to get away with wearing this blue suit. And, uh, I know, I know. He's a headdress. I, I feel under a great deal of pressure. <laughs> Um, but, but Tristram, uh, it's great that you've uh, come to do this interview, um, and I'm going to give you a little introduction, and then you, we're going to introduce the V&A with a short video. Um, Tristram, as, as a museum director, I think has taken a really interesting path into uh, museology and museums. He was an academic uh, historian, published several books um, on Victorian cities, uh, on a biography of Friedrich Engels, um, a book more recently about imperial cities, Victorian cities. He was a politician, uh, and uh, how well did that go? That was, well, I don't know. It seems to have gone even worse since I left. Uh, that's my, my analysis. Well, there's, there's always room to go back, or time to go back. No, but no, Tristram done. was an MP uh, for um, the Stoke-on-Trent central seat, really important uh, seat in terms of its history and, and the link there, and I'm sure we'll come on to that, that it's the place where the potteries were in the, well, from the 18th century and through the 19th century and, and still today, uh, and that's something you've been very interested in. And you were the Shadow Secretary of State for Education as well. So, I mean, a serious political career, uh, and then in 2017 you announced that you were taking up the job as a director of the V&A. And before I let you talk about that, I'm going to play this video if I can. <laughs> I'm really glad I pay all my taxes so you can make such nice music videos. Uh, um, Trish, Trish, let, me, let me start off by, by asking you um, about that route into museum directorship. Uh, and I mean, 
does it still feel like it's been a strange or different trajectory from academia through politics into, into the museum? My background as a, as a historian was in mid-19th century urban cultural history of Victorian Britain. And so joining the V&A felt intensely familiar in terms of the history which I had, I had studied. Um, the, the difference between a historian and, and a museum director is that as a historian, you, you, you tend to look for the narrative, you tend to look for the arc, you tend to look for the explanation. And in the museum, you start with the object and the power and the wonder of the object. In a sense, you move out from the object. And as a historian, you put the object uh, to, in, you, you start by initially thinking, where does that fit within the broader story? So learning to begin with the artifact and the house collection and the object was, was a big change in thinking. And then as a Moving from being a, a politician where, as Thomas said, I was very privileged to represent Stoke-on-Trent, which is the potteries, it's the Midlands heart uh, of the ceramic industry where we had a big fight in 2013-14 to save the Wedgwood collection, which was going to be uh, dispersed and sold around the world. Moving from, from politics to museum was very interesting in terms of thinking about the past because what you discover when you work at the Palace of Westminster is that there's this very cloying sense of historicism, like a very powerful sense of nostalgia. And so even at the v and I'm surrounded by 5,000 years of history telling the story of human creativity, but there's no nostalgia in the museum. Mm. There's this really rigorous, critical, energetic engagement with the nature of the past and the contemporary meaning of the past. And so I think in politics, we wallow a lot in the past, particularly in Britain uh, at the moment. Uh, whereas in museums, we kind of, we're having this wrestle with the past. We're having this conversation with the past, which feels much more energizing. I, I'm just going to interrupt the flow of, of the questions that I prepared because I, we asked in Apollo um, last month whether the Houses of Parliament this wonderful Pugin building should be turned into a museum. Do, do you think it should become a museum? I don't think it should become a museum because I, th I think there is a... Uh, as, as, as soon as you turn it into a museum, it, it will lose its sensibility. Um, and actually what, what keeps the kind of... the aura of the building is the functioning of democracy within it. That said, I don't like being in that building that much. I find it very enervating. I find it very, there's, there's, there, there's, a, there's a bad karma uh, to uh, large parts of that, that building. And I, what would be good would be, I think, not just a full kind of conservation operation, but you do want, I think now, some form of contemporary intervention within the restoration program. Mm. I, th I think a, general, we kind a of, general election, I think it's called. Well, <laughs> there could be that as well, exactly. exactly. I, think we, I think as a country, we kind of need it. Um, but moving from, I mean, that point, you were pre presumably contemplating leaving politics and the job came up. Um, tragically, the former director, uh, well, the former director had, had left, in fact, but, but uh, later, Martin Roth uh, died quite soon afterwards. Um, just tell me, when you went into the meetings with the trustees, Nicholas Coleridge was the chairman of trustees, what, what was your elevator pitch going in to take the, the V&A directorship? It was, it was primarily about education um, and the importance of education within museums. That the the V&A began in the design school movement of the 1830s and 40s, and unlike many other museums, it, it, was, it was not a place to sort of wander in the sublime and retreat from the world. It always had this quite sort of functional um, purpose in, in teaching art and design. Prince Albert called it a central storehouse of art and science to encourage creativity. And we have this almost crippling problem in, in the UK at the moment of the stripping out of, of creativity within our education system. So for a, for a museum like the V&A, born of the design school movement, it seemed to me to have this 
absolutely pivotal role at a pivotal moment to think about uh, education. So I made a strong pitch around education. We've begun that, helping to teach design right around the country, mm. professional development um, of design teachers. But I also made the case, I think, that the V&A under you know, great directors like Mark Jones, my predecessor, great chairs, and we've got Paul Ruddock with us here uh, this afternoon, had transformed itself. But within the popular imagination and public consciousness, I felt there was another step to go. I felt its voice could be, uh, could be further amplified. And hopefully its profile has also been raised in the last two years. I'm definitely going to move on to... Uh, or move on to moving backwards to Henry Cole, the foundation of the South Kensington Museum. But just to, to talk one more question about moving into the museum for you. And you mentioned the different approach to objects. Just can you say a bit about how you've been discovering the collection and some of the challenges of working with curators and thinking about actual objects and conservation and the stewardship of them? It's very different from what you were working on before. It's very different. I mean, the, 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 the wonder of my post is that when a meeting is cancelled, I can go into the glass galleries or the ceramics galleries or go and look at the Donatellos or go and look at the Turners, and, you know, that is the profound privilege. And understanding the V&A collection, it's 17 national collections in one building from the art of photography uh, to textile, ceramics, glass, uh, uh, sculpture. Uh, and so there's just a never-ending understanding um, of the collections. But I think what, what I've sort of wrestled with then is that, that those, those broader obligations to the collection around conservation and science and restoration and the handling and understanding that. And as ever, you know, I'm, I'm trying to kind of, you know, um, take some of this out of me, but I'm not quite a politician in a hurry, but you always want to do more quickly. Mm. Um, and understanding some of the museum rhythms um, are there now? One shouldn't fall into all of those, and one should challenge those. Uh, but there are also an understanding of the systems of how museums function uh, and operate, which at sometimes is incredibly fast-moving and innovative and dynamic. And at other times, you 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 do not understand why this picture could not have been put up within mm. nine months. But do you think you have a mandate coming in as a new director to a massive national museum like that to also be a bit of a disruptor coming in from outside curatorial work and, and, and that side of museums? Yes and no. I think, I think I also had to show the curatorial body and the, all those members of staff who aren't curators but love the collection, understand the collection and cherish the collection, that coming from a non-museum background as a historian and a politician that I had great respect and growing understanding for what the museum did and what it was for. And, you know, there's this sort of, you know, classic notion, you've got this 18-month window and if you don't achieve then, you're never going to achieve it. I don't believe that. If you, hopefully, if you, if you set yourself there, say, well, I, you know, I, I hope to be in this job for a, for a good period of time and actually, you know, a, a sustained program of change is what mm -hmm. I want to uh, achieve. I, and I also, just briefly, I also um, inherited a museum in great shape. Um, and that's, that's, as I said to the trustees in my interview, that has not always been the case at the v &A. There's normally this, this rather you know, dangerous cycle within the museum. But actually, I was very privileged to inherit a museum in really strong shape. Well, there's obviously been the future plan, and a lot of galleries have been refurbished over the last 15 years. I think I read 85% of, yeah. of the galleries, in fact. But, but let's talk about one of the projects that you inherited, I suppose, but is, I know is very close to your heart. And, and feeling for the 19th century. So we're going to talk a bit about the cast courts. And um, I mean, how far does this, this project, well, first of all, perhaps you might explain to, to the audience who, who might not know the cast courts what their significance is, but also how that fits into the v &A today, mirroring and remembering the mission of the founding by, by Prince Albert, Henry Cole, and some of those other really enlightened figures of the 19th century. So, so the cast courts, when we've got the, the Western cast court here, and then there's the Ruddock family cast court um, on the other side, are really one of the, the, the kind of the, the most important spaces within the museum. Henry Cole, who was the first director of the Victoria and Albert uh, Museum, had this great passion for democratizing culture. And the growth of reproductive technologies. Uh, plaster cast, electrotype, and photography in the 1850s and 1860s 
allowed working people in London to see Michelangelo's David. They could never go to Florence uh, in their wildest imaginations, but here Florence uh, was coming to them, or Pisano's uh, uh, pulpit. Um, and, and, and so the notion of democratizing, and, and one of the tragedies is actually there was also lots of South Asian plaster casts as well, which were then destroyed or dispersed in the interwar uh, uh, periods, of democratizing high culture for the people through technology. And so it, it's a very v &A story about democracy, because the V&A was also the first to introduce gas lighting to the museum so people could come after work to see the collections, first to introduce a restaurant and a cafe so you could have an enjoyable time uh, at the museum. But also this, this really interesting mix of modernism and historicism. What Cole liked was taking the most advanced technologies of the day and understanding the past through it. And why we're particularly excited by these galleries at the moment is that all of the conversations today about digital scanning, about 3D reproduction, uh, about the ownership of kind of metadata surrounding scans, Cole was wrestling with all of this in the 1850s and 60s, and he, he, he created in 1867 this, this agreement between all the crown princes uh, of Europe to share their collections for the purpose of plaster casts. So for us at the V&A, these, these sublime spaces, as everyone called them at the time, are really, really significant. I mean, these historicist places as well, and, yeah. and that sense of uh, preserving, although in a collage of the past and of, of art history and of global art history as well. But would it be fair to say that in, in some way the cast courts are almost the most contemporary spaces of the v and they, they feel incredibly um, contemporary, but, all, but, but, uh, but also almost this kind of sketch way you, you think about uh, them, that you, you, you're herding them together. And they haven't changed since. I mean, the, uh, the, the other cast court you see it has the same items it had in 1872. Um, and yet, next to it, we have you know, 3D scans of um, the, 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 the Palmyra Arch. Uh, we have uh, some of the latest uh, technology which has been used um, in the Middle East for the preservation and restoration of artifacts. So they do absolutely feel incredibly contemporary and energetic. And, and this thing about for Henry Cole, for the South Kensington Museum, I mean, improving design was a, was a moral and, uh, and social principle. And you talk about the museum still being able to, or, or increasingly again, being able to train designers. C can you say a little bit more about how, that's, how that can work in practice? Because obviously you can go into the museum and, and on the ground floor you can be floods of, of people trying to look at the highlights and so on. H how actually can a museum today really improve design and its quality? 40% of visitors to the v &A describe themselves as from the creative industries. So this notion of the museum as a, as a storehouse, as a treasury for inspiration, just through the presentation of the artefacts remains important. And when you talk in the UK to Thomas Heatherwick or Anya Highmarsh or Norman Foster, just, just coming to the V&A for free, seven days a week, to drop in to see the collection as a source of inspiration remains incredibly powerful. So there's, th there's mm. that role, just almost kind of being there and keeping the, uh, the collections um, open and free. Um, and then there's also the incredibly important education uh, work. And m m my passion is to share this collection more widely around the country. So we've instituted a program called uh, Design Lab Nation, which works across um, six um, cities and towns across uh, non-metropolitan England in former industrial centres where we know design teaching is in difficulties, where we know communities are going to struggle to get their kids to come to the museum. So we're taking the artefacts out to local museums, working with local schools, training uh, design teachers and using our artefacts to inspire uh, art and design. And we're going to, and we're going to kind of be doing more on this um, in the coming and, and years. And those are actual artefacts or actually 3D no. reproductions so as the, well. So, so the teachers come to, to, to the museum in South Kensington uh, and we say, what would you like to borrow for your course? And they say, well, you know, I'd like to borrow Raphael's cartoons. And we say, well, you know. If you can't have 
Raphael's cartoons? Is there anything else we can offer? Uh, and, then, and then we get to, and we, um, and so whether it's the Potteries Museum uh, in Stoke, whether it's the um, Textile Museum in Blackburn, in Lancashire, whether it's the Glass Museum up in Sunderland, we're then sending some great works out there, which hopefully provide the kind of kindling and inspiration um, for, for, for people to be inspired. And, the, and again, the V&A has had this long history because it had what was called the Circulation Department, which, which began in the, in, 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 in the early 1900s, which had this very conscious idea of circulating its artefacts right across the country. And I think if you look at the collections at the V&A, which emerged... You know, many of them from the 1851 Great Exhibition. Well, those come from Sheffield and Sunderland and Blackburn and Stoke. You know, our collections are born from those parts of the country. So, in a sense, returning the obligation and the favour back there seems an important thing to do. And we'll talk about other ways that's happening a, a bit later on. But since you mentioned the Great Exhibition, since we've <laughs> mentioned in passing Prince Albert, the V&A has, since 1899, I think, had in its title, the names of the monarchs. Victoria Shall we see and the Albert. coronet? I, I was... Sorry, you were going, going to go press there. The button. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, I mean, in, in a, well, in 2019, what, what's the sort of role of, and especially that this is the bicentenary year of both Victoria and Albert, what is the role of, of those names above the door of the museum and, and, and on all the marketing and the fact of of monarchy uh, uh, as an inspiration for this museum? First of all, let me just say something about this. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is the diamond and sapphire coronet which Prince Albert designed for Queen Victoria for their wedding. Um, and when Albert died, then um, it became a great symbol for Victoria of, of, her, of her loss. Um, and... Uh, it's, on, it's on the great Winterhalter uh, uh, portraits of Queen Victoria, and we managed to acquire it uh, recently through a very generous gift from William Bollinger, uh, and now it sits at the heart of our jewellery gallery. It's our kind of eternal flame um, in the museum uh, on, as, as Thomas said, the 200th anniversary uh, of the birth of Victoria and Albert. And I think, you're, you know, th th there was a, a, quite an open conversation 10, 15 years ago, you know, should the names Victoria and Albert be, be sort of dropped uh, from the museum. And obviously there was a kind of shift in branding. We, you know, we describe ourselves more as v &A than the Victoria and Albert. But I'm, I'm very proud of the name Victoria and Albert um, bec because you have to understand the mission. And Albert's mission was about manufacturing, design, technology, democracy, open access, all, all of these components. Um, and so I think what you do in any institution is you go back to its founding mission and purpose and see what, how that makes sense today. And I can see all sorts of relevance in that. And I also think it's, it's a weird thing in the UK that we, we were created by the Crown. We weren't created by the government um, or, or, or Henry Tate or there's a different lineage to us, which also gives us a degree of kind of independence um, and, a degree, and, and a degree of, of a kind of different story to us. And, and on our new um, uh, Exhibition Road entrance, where we have these, these new gates, we've put, you know, and th these were only opened uh, two years ago. You saw the picture of the Duchess opening them. We put the crown up there. And we didn't need to put the crown back up on some of our artefacts in 2016, but, but we felt it was important to the institution. And I suppose also, I mean, this moment of Albert being a foreign uh, um, emigre to, well, uh, I mean, a rather privileged emigre uh, uh, to, to, to Britain, uh, uh, and the other, the other um, German intellectuals who, who were there with him, Gustav Wagen and Gottfried Semper and people like that, that in a sense this already was an international museum by, by the nature of its very founding. I think that's so important. I mean, the, the, the origins of the museum are British, European and extra-European. I mean, there's a, clearly a you know, British story to the establishment, but... Uh, Albert of saxe coburg gotha uh, was uh, from, from the European continent, brings with him these, these continental refugees from the 1848-1849 uh, revolutions, one of whom, Gottfried Semper, has this wonderful phrase. He, he describes museums as the true teachers of a free people. 
uh, that they have, again, this, this civic role. And then within the collection, we also have our East India Company collection, our, our South Asia collection. So from the beginning, there's this international component to what the V&A is about. And I think, as you say, particularly now with, you know, sort of ugly um, currents of chauvinism and nationalism, uh, having a consciously British institution with these European and extra-European lineages is really significant. So it's a sort of meta question, because it, it, the question is the same, but does that mean that you find yourself answering a lot of questions about imperialism? Yes, yeah, I mean, I mean we, we, are, we are an institution also born of the imperial and the colonial moment. So all of the conversations today um, around kind of decolonization and uh, the responsibilities of institutions like the VNA to to the collections we hold is, is, is I mean, the range and extent of our uh, collections, which are, uh, as it were, disputed, are, are markedly less than some other uh, uh, institutions. But it absolutely affects us, and more than affects us, we, sh we need to be engaged in that conversation. Mm. We'll, we'll get on to that, because I, I want to talk as well about one way in which you aren't, uh, as it were, London-centric, and one way in which you have obviously spread the wings of the V&A, or the V&A has spread its wings, is with its collaborations with V&A Dundee, with um, the plans, well, I'm sure, it's still London, but it's East London for V&A East, and even with the Design Society uh, in uh, China, is it Shenzhen? Shenzhen. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you first of all about what the significance of, of V&A Dundee has been for the V&A, not so much as a brand, but as a museum and as a, as a museum that has a, a very promising future. So this is V&A Dundee on the banks of the Tay, uh, designed by the Japanese architect Kengo Kuma, um, opened in September uh, last year. Uh, half a million visitors uh, within six months in a city of 150,000. So everyone's had to come three times at least, uh, and we keep counting. Um, and it's a, it's a museum of Scottish design. It tells the story of Scotland's influence on design around the world and, uh, and, and vice versa. In a city facing big challenges in terms of low income, um, unemployment, post-industrial um, strategy, and to have a really conscious investment in culture has been, has been profound. We've learned a great deal about it as an institution because for a long time it had neither a collection nor a building, yet it was much more invested as a cultural institution in the lives and communities of local people than many institutions with very large buildings and very large collections. So, so we've learned uh, in terms of the, um, of the development of it. And it goes back, interestingly, to that, in a sense, that conversation around monarchy and identity, that, you know, the v &A in South Kensington is in England. Uh, there are, you know, growing tensions, but it's more febrile than it has been in the past between Scotland and England. Having a UK institution in Dundee, um, you know, we share the same monarchs and, and, and other things, is, is, is an important cultural um, signifier. It's not a franchise, it's not an outpost. We, the V&A, we're only 20% of the board, even though it's called V&A uh, Dundee. So it's a partnership with the city council, local universities, uh, the government. Um, so we think it's a really kind of enterprising way of, of, of approaching this. So why, why do, is that, that, that you have the branding, but you only have 20% of the, what, the management responsibilities? Or Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, b built uh, by Dundee City Council, uh, supported by the Scottish government. We... we we were, as, as many institutions were, rightly under, and we have the, the chairman here who might want to say more about its inspiration, um, were under pressure um, to ensure that our collection went as widely um, as, as possible. But what we didn't want was exactly that, a series of, of, of franchises. What we wanted to do was create a different model which was invested in, in the area. So the director of V&A Dundee answers to me only as one of five trustees. Uh, I'm not, as it were, the, 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 the line manager, it's the, it's the chair of trustees there. So it was a different model of doing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but we brought our brand strength, the collection is the V&As and it sits there, uh, and we brought our curatorial strength uh, to it. And hopefully, uh, at, the, at the moment, into the future, it's working well. I mean, there's so much V&A programming these days. I get almost as many emails from the V&A as I do from Gagosian. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> um, 
v and East uh, is something that we should talk about. Obviously, this is on the former London Olympic uh, Park. It seemed to me that it was always a project that was slightly slow in getting going. I mean, it's something that people have been talking about for 10 years. And may maybe it was slow in getting going because it, it sort of had Boris Johnson's imprimatur over it in, in the initial um, moments when he was mayor of London. But uh, talk to me now about you know, why is this going to really change what the VNA can do with its collections? This is a really exciting um, initiative in the east end of London on the Olympic Park where the 2012 Olympics was held. And I think, without sort of banging the drum, I think London's done really well um, with its Olympic legacy. You see so many of those kind of wastelands after the Olympics. And actually in London, the housing, the cultural infrastructure, the development has been taken really seriously uh, and done well. The next step is, is, is a project called East Bank, which is a collaboration between Sadler's Wells Dance Company, the BBC, the London College of Fashion, and ourselves with the Smithsonian Institution. I've just been up in Washington with colleagues there. So on the left, you can see um, the Waterfront Museum, which the VNA will be co-curating with the Smithsonian. Um, so we are being able to draw in some of the great collections from the Native American collection, air and space, African American art, um, right across the Smithsonian to bring it to East London. And East London is. Um, well, the population at the moment is 65% black and minority, 65 black and minority uh, ethnic. It's the youngest, it's the most diverse, it's the fastest growing. And with the best will in the world, we often find it difficult to bring those communities to South Kensington. Uh, and so we're going there. And the ambition um, for the Waterfront Museum is to have a really strong thematic approach to programming. So rather than that kind of encyclopedic vision, the pursuance of arguments through the collections about design, about design moments, about creativity, whilst also drawing on big kind of polemical questions of the day, are, and we're, we're thinking um, of... I, don't, I can't. It will, can't be, it will be free as well, or free entry, uh, absolutely, um, with new, uh, with, with paid for um, exhibitions uh, on on the kind of um, English uh, model, and it's it's very exciting. I would say bringing together some of the the VNA skill in uh, exhibition and design with the kind of great bench strength of the Smithsonian curatorial. Uh, understanding and collections. And so we're very excited by this. And then on the right, what you see is the um, design from Liz Diller for our new collections and research centre. Um, and what this is, is um, an attempt to kind of fuse that, that, that traditional divide between storage and gallery. Uh, we are being moved out of our reserve storage facility in West London at the moment. And so on the same Olympic site, what we're doing is creating a massive open access V&A vault so that you will be able to wander through the reserve collection of the V&A. Um, the problem with Liz Diller's uh, imagery, it all seems we have the world's largest collection of sculptural busts. Uh, actually, our, our sculptural bust collection is not as extensive uh, as Liz uh, <laughs> thinks. Um, but what we'll also be doing there is, in a very V&A way, is rebuilding some of our great historic rooms. Uh, the V&A rooms like this have all, has always kind of taken salvage from, from areas under destruction. And we have, uh, every day, we have an American visitor who comes to South Kensington and says, where can I see... Uh, the, the Kaufman office designed by Frank Lloyd Wright uh, and you can't because it's all in bits at the moment and we're going to rebuild that so we're going to rebuild kind of 10 great historic rooms within this collection and so there'll be these clearings in the forest where you can discover these moments so it's a big project and I understand the, the geographical argument about <coughs> a more deprived uh, area of London uh, and the boroughs around there does it keep you awake at night thinking not so much how you're going to fundraise for the project, but, but actually how you're going to pay to keep it going? Do, will you be, have more government grant in aid or do you need more private funding for it? These are huge projects to keep, I mean, you, you have to expand your staff and, and you name it. I mean, it, it does, I mean, most, yeah, <laughs> those kind of things keep me, I mean, most things keep me awake um, on that front. But no, we will get, um, we will receive extra grant and aid for the running um, of the museum. We were invited by the government to go there, so we said yes, but we, you know, we, we, we will need um, support uh, for it. And we'll also need, yeah, absolutely, uh, philanthropic support. But I think the, the, 
the other point to make about this is that East London was always the arrival point um, in, in, in the UK. Uh, I mean, this, this was the arrival point for post-war Caribbean community, before that it was for the Jewish community, uh, after that for a Bengali, Bangladeshi uh, heritage community. And as a result, it's a place of great enterprise, but also a place of great designing and making. This is a kind of making community. So, you know, what is the VNA about? This is about supporting makers and designers and creatives. This is a landscape full of creativity, a, a quite a, you know, an, an intimate I mean, you sphere. Have, you already have another museum in East London, the Museum of Childhood Absolutely. in Bethnal Green. Absolutely. I, I think one thing that's interesting about that museum as a tangent, but when Richard Wallace, who obviously left, left his and, and the Marquis of Hartford, his father's uh, collection to the nation, and it went into Manchester House in Manchester Square, but he had put those works on in that museum in Bethnal Green. Yes. And it, and it must have been one of the most popular exhibitions of the 19th century. And there you are. This was, it, it, it's one of those fallacies that things that are gold can't go into no, <laughs> deprived no, areas or something and, like that. And actually, so, so the, the, the museum in East London, which is, has been there since 18... Um, 72, and again in a very disadvantaged part uh, of the capital, it was where the VNA used to put its most contemporary artifacts uh, in communities that you wouldn't think would actually respond to that, and they responded incredibly mm. positively. Just uh, before we open some questions, I, one other topic I really want to, to discuss is that I mean, perhaps it's your political experience, but I feel like you've stepped into the role of being a museum director and being willing and not afraid to make public statements. Your predecessor sometimes expressed to me and also to other journalists the feeling that he was sometimes corralled into not being able to say things and, and penned in because of his role as, uh, as, uh, well, as a museum director reporting to some degree to the Department for Culture. Do you think it's, it is part of your role to, to be able to speak out as, as a museum director? I mean, you, some of the things that you've said, that, or is it, do you think that because you were a politician and a public figure, whatever you say gets reported on anyway? I think, it's, I think you, can't, you can't comment on party politics. I mean, you can't, and, and, and particularly someone from my uh, background. Um, and there are, quite rightly, sort of strict rules about those who take public money, as I do, and I'm a, I'm, I, I, I answer to both my chair of trustees but also to the Department um, for Culture. So I do have to be uh, objective and take that kind of mm. seriously. But I think you, you do also want cultural leaders, whether it's in museums or galleries or the BBC or, or um, uh, journalism, um, to be able to contribute to the public discourse, and whether that's around issues of you know, relations with Europe, whether that's about our kind of colonial past, um, whether that's questions of, I'm a big supporter, although, yes, I, I probably shouldn't say much more, but I'm a supporter of a hotel tax in London to support, you know, every, you go to every other city around the world mm. and there's a hotel tax to support cultural infrastructure. Well, it's okay uh, if it gets invested in cultural yeah, infrastructure. That is I the, mean, this is the argument in Rome at the moment, that it yeah. just disappears and, and things aren't improving. Yeah. So, but, I mean, do you think that those ideas, I mean, do you feel like you, you can lobby and who are you lobbying? You're lobbying public opinion or you're actually yeah, lobbying I don't the government? Yeah, I don't think I can lobby to change, uh, I mean, there are kind of areas where the sort of, you know, the museums come together and behind the scenes seek, seek to assuage public opinion. But before, as it were, you get to a situation where government has decided X or Y, I think you, I think you can help to, uh, to shape the debate. And I think, you know, it, it, there are political questions and whether it's kind of mass tourism, whether it's cultural appropriation, these are mm -hmm. issues which we're kind of wrestling with in the public realm and those voices in museums if they're you know whether they're publicly funded or not should I think probably contribute to that. Do you think I mean museums perhaps more than 10-15 years ago seem to be constantly on the defensive at the moment on the defensive about who their funders are on the defensive about who sponsored them on the defensive about where objects have come from why there isn't yet enough diversity in their collections and in their audiences I mean, that's mostly pretty tiring, always being on the defensive, or do you have to step forward and, and, and make a play to change the, the debate yourself? But also, I don't... I, don't, I mean, it's, it's kind of... It's, it's, it is febrile, and, and it, is, it is political, but I also sometimes don't think my colleagues understand 
the extent of their own authority and the, the power of their own positions to help shape and, 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 and manage this. And if you are always on defensive, if you are always you know, having to run your words through your press office and other things, then, 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 you know, then, then, then you're not helping to kind of shape the contours of that. And the other thing is I've, you know, having been in politics, in, you know, some colleagues can get very worried by, you know, you know, small articles appearing on page 19 of the art newspaper um, that were, I say, you know, only when you've been denounced three days in a row on the front page of a tabloid should you begin to worry. At that, at that point, <laughs> that's the kind of tipping point. Prior to that, I think you can sort of manage these things. Have you ever imagined what the headlines would be on the front of the sun? Yeah, it's always, it's always crisis at the museum. That's always, it's, we're, we're always, every museum director is heading towards that at some point. But I mean, a lot of your, your fellow national museums, the Tate and the National Portrait Gallery, have uh, put out statements saying they're not going to take any more funding from the Sackler uh, family, at least the branch which has been uh, related to Purdue Pharma. And your new courtyard opened, what, 2014, is the Sackler yep. Courtyard. Yes. Is, is, this, is this problematic for... For you, uh, in terms of having that name, and and, and Teresa Sackler is one of our trustees, and we're we're grateful to her to her service. Um, I mean, our position now is that the Sackler um, family have said they're not going to be funding any more um, uh, cultural activities or arts activities um, into the future, and and we we respect that, mm. but we're not taking any names down. In terms of things that are historical, you, you also have, uh, I mean, you spoke about the Magdala artifacts from Ethiopia, a, a display of, well, looking at the provenance research, it's something that clearly is very important to you and to, and to your colleagues at the V&A. Um, you've also, in the context of that, talked about museums as uh, safe spaces to explore difficult ideas. And I thought maybe we, we could end before opening to some questions from the audience with just explaining what, what you mean by, by that. I think um, it's very, very important um, in, in an era which is kind of so febrile in terms of politics and so divided, both here in the States and, and, and in the UK, that to go back to that kind of Gottfried Semper idea of museums as true teachers of a free people, to have civic spaces where, where difficult ideas can be explored and reflected upon in, in a kind of respectful manner. And museums can help to provide those kind, that kind of public sphere. I think what we also do is provide stories of multiculturalism and exchange and interaction adaptation through our collections. And in an era of chauvinism and, and populism and nationalism actually telling the complicated stories of how traditions and identities and peoples share from one another over time, which is what our collections are about, uh, seems to me you know, very, very important. And finally, um, I, I'm a strong, and this is where it gets a really interesting tension about opening up museums in terms of kind of co-curation, but also a strong belief in the role of the curator, because again, in an era of sort of, you know, Facebook echo chambers and fake news and social media, museums as trusted institutions to provide, you know, clearly researched, well-sourced accounts of the history of objects or the uh, accounts of history, um, of, of displaying that knowledge and not being uncomfortable about saying knowledge is important, expertise is important, and museums are places within which it's housed. Um, again, seems to me something we should be confident about doing. We shouldn't be arrogant about this. We have mistakes. No museum is neutral. We kind of get all that. But in an era when we're, we're, we're so obsessed by uh, the, the, the merits and virtues uh, of, of relativism. H having um, you know, places of knowledge and understanding where curators work over decades to understand the, the, the nature of objects and the history of artifacts, um, we need to make the case for that. Um, and so you bring together people here in our globe, in our Europe galleries, a very kind of enlightenment uh, idea, uh, having really interesting and provocative and powerful but respectful discussions, um, often about complicated and quite divisive um, issues. And I think so, so rather than, you know, museums in crisis, actually museums, you know, 
More people are coming to museums. They're looking online. They're coming through the doors. Um, museums are leading debates. And actually, they, they seem to be more important today. If you were going to choose one object that you would run a session like this on as, as the centerpiece from the collection, what, what would it be? We have... It's not quite as good as the one in the Rijksmuseum. Uh, but we have um, a superb um, uh, Dutch... Delftware tulip holder in the shape of a Chinese pagoda. <laughs> so here you have a story of the, the, the Dutch imitating sort of uh, blue and white ware from China, itself taking cobalt from Iran to create this design, which then comes to Holland, which is then designed in the shape of a Chinese pagoda to house a national flower which originates in Iran. And it seems to me in one, <laughs> in one object you've got, you've got an account, uh, which, then, which then Queen Mary introduces to Britain in the 1680s. Uh, and so everyone then in, 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 in Britain in the 18th century obviously wants a Delfware tulip pagoda. <laughs> With the world in the museum and exactly. the world of the museum. Um, I'm going to open the floor to some questions, if that's okay with you, sure. Tristan. We've got about 10 minutes. There's a gentleman uh, over here. There's a microphone just on its way to you behind. Thanks very much. Wonderful conversation. Um, I want to take you back to the moment when you were talking about the cast courts, and you both totally happily agreed that this was the most contemporary space in the, uh, in the museum. Please tell us, in which ways is it contemporary? Can you elaborate that for us? Um, oh, there. Oh, no, you don't want the video, do you? No, I don't um, want it. I think it's contemporary in terms of the issues that it throws up um, because what, one of the, the, the challenges we're, we're dealing with now and as a, as, a, as a museum is, in a sense, rights over the reproduction of imagery and artefacts. Who, who owns this? Should we have the right to reproduce today uh, great works from museums. I mean, so, so the Met and the Rijksmuseum have allowed open access to their, to, to, to their uh, collections at kind of high resolution um, online, but not open access uh, in terms of entry because you have to pay $25. Uh, we, we don't have open access to, our, to, 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 to the full um, um, no, I have to imagery. pay hundred pounds every time yeah, I print good. that image in, uh, in Apollo. <laughs> but but I think I think it's the question of in a digital society where there is universal access to imagery. What are the kind of socio-political questions and cultural questions connected to that? And the, and the big kind of um, sort of um, case connected to this was the the, the hacking Nefertiti. So an artist goes in and scans uh, Nef the Nefertiti in, in Berlin uh, uh, and then uploads the imagery of Nefertiti online for everyone to, to, to have access to and play with. Um, now, is, is that, what does, you know, who owns Nefertiti um, at that point and who should own it, given that, as it were, you know, it certainly wasn't originally made in Germany. Um, uh, and, and, and then, again, it becomes very interesting and it, with the Smithsonian, for example. So the Smithsonian have handed back a lot of their Native American artifacts to tribal communities um, and have produced 3D reproductions of those. Is that right when, when, when obviously it's the kind of, you know, the, 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 the religious sanctity associated with the originality relative to the reproduction? And if they uploaded the data of those reproductions... Could anyone with a 3D printer themselves print something like this? So I think in, in the kind of digital world we exist in, um, some of the issues which the cast courts throw up is, is, is what makes it modern. And, and I'm not going to answer it. I just asked the question as a, as a leading question to, to see what he would say. Uh, there's a lady here. Yes. yes. So thank you so much. I have, if I spent 
time in the National Art Library and V&A, it's I've almost as much time as I spent at the Met and at the Frick, so thank you for providing the, that access. But um, my question is, uh, as you know, uh, the V&A, or the South Kensington Museum, was the really inspiration for so many American museums when they were founded in the 1870s and thereafter. Uh, and in fact, they were, many of them started with cast collections, which they've all more or less sold. Um, is there a museum in America that you see as an equivalent to the V&A, or what advice would you give those? I mean, the Cooper Hewitt really is not exactly like the V&A. There really is no equivalent in the States, but I think that we could learn a lot from what the V&A is doing in the UK. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I wouldn't dare to give uh, advice um, to, to colleagues um, because I think, I think the, you know, we, we Brit, you know, British museum directors come to America and are kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're bowled over um, by the great, the great generosity of, of, of the philanthropic community in America and their contributions um, um, to these uh, museums, the great exhibitions, the, the, the community work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think clearly in Philadelphia, there's a very strong connection to, um, um, to um, the... Um, uh, to the V&A. Uh, I think in San Francisco, the de Jong has elements of, um, 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 uh, sorry, the, the other one, the Museum of Fine Arts. The Region of Honor, uh, Legion of Honor, um, has, has collection, connections um, um, to the V&A and, and the Cooper Hewitt as part, as part of the uh, Smithsonian. But there is, I, I mean, I think you're right, there's a particularity around the V&A, which then you can see in the Mac in Vienna, which obviously mm. has, a, has a much greater kind of Resonance and collection, and that again was the was was the European story that from the V&A many because of partly because of Albert and Albert's vision, you see the transference of of, of that um, idea across the European uh, continent, um, and it's you know you you wouldn't sort of. If you're starting a museum today, as it were, you wouldn't start with 17 national collections in, <laughs> in, in one, which is the great strength, but also the challenge. Because it is also a place of anomalies, and Absolutely. to a degree, the painting collection, which is a wonderful painting collection, when you stumble across it and you think, gosh, I didn't... I mean, you, the V&A is a museum that you can go to day after day, year on year, and still find whole collections that you didn't know existed, yeah. know, right? I mean, um, no, I mean, and the, the, the most embarrassing thing is when you go to an exhibition in someone else's museum and you go, oh, that's interesting, that's a nice piece, and you realise it's from the V&A. <laughs> you know, this, is, this, is, this is an embarrassing moment. Is there another question? John. Yes. Well, my question is uh, the reasoning uh, at this point. My question is the reasoning at this point for free admission uh, for non-British uh, uh, visitors. Uh, the Met, as you just said, has now, it's not voluntary anymore. Uh, you pay, and most major museums in the world, there are a few exceptions, you pay. Well, why does the, uh, you feel that the non-British shouldn't pay as well as the British? I mean, the, 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 the kind of, the crude answer is that because we're a national museum, we're subject to government policy. Yeah. And, it's, and it's the policy of the government uh, that there should be free entry to national museums. And we get 50% of our funding uh, from uh, the UK government. And that is, in a sense, that supports uh, the policy of, of, um, of free entry. I think if, the, if that was markedly reduced, which uh, at times it's under threat of, our trustees, who have a legal obligation to care for the collection, would be asking some difficult questions about how they could do that. Um, but for the, for the V&A, because our, our, our kind of numbers, you know, three, four million uh, visitors are, are healthy, um, our business model works is that you don't pay when you come in, but you pay at the shop or the cafe or the exhibition. Um, or in some, so so we, we are in a very lucky position because the quality of our offer in retail and catering and exhibition, that in a sense we, we, we get a very strong income stream from that. And if you, if you do introduce charging, your numbers drop by 50%. Um, and so 
you know, we're in a situation, where, and, and it's very lucky, there are other museums in, in the UK, particularly regional museums with free entry, who are really struggling mm -hmm. uh, with the, that. The late Edmund Capon, a uh, great museum director in Australia, who, who passed away a couple of months ago, who used to say, pay to make them leave. That's, you know, you, you've got to find ways to make sure they, put, they, they open their wallet yes. to get out of the museum. Yes, exactly, exactly. Exit exactly. through the gift <laughs> shop. Uh, do we have time for one more question? The lady in the penultimate row. Thank you very much. Um, uh, full disclosure, I work at the Met, so, but I'm actually really interested in hearing, because unlike the Met, the v &A has this strong tradition of research and a whole division dedicated to research in addition to curatorial. And I wondered if you could speak to that kind of coexistence between these two branches of the v &A and how it works and what, what are the strengths and perhaps also the weaknesses of that model? Um, I think the... Uh, the research department, which has been a very, very um, important part um, um, of, of the V&A for, for, for a long time, partly because also our connection with the Royal College of Art and the education, the kind of higher educational component we had. Um, thanks, to a, thanks to a gift from the Mellon Foundation, we, we now have a, a, a kind of bolstered research facility, which is the, um, the Research Institute. And it's it, it, it's a challenge sometimes in that on the one hand you want kind of blue skies academic research because out of that comes um, the, um, the great work. On, on, on the other hand, as a sort of director, you're thinking, well, how, how can this, you know, not in a very kind of functional way benefit the exhibition next year, but what are the strands that we're working on in the coming uh, five to seven years? So when we appoint fellows, when we appoint joint scholarships, when we appoint... Um, uh, PhDs, we are beginning to ensure that the work of the Research Institute connects to the broader strategic objectives of the museum. If I'm honest, uh, I will be, um, what, 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 what you've seen in the UK in the last 10 years is that thanks to the introduction of tuition fees, the, 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 the research strength and capacity of university departments has grown, I, I mean, I don't know what you think, Thomas, I, markedly compared to museums. Um, and w w were, we try, were we to seek to be able to kind of bulk up to the same degree as some university departments, that would be a, a really significant investment that, I, frankly, we couldn't afford um, um, at the moment. Um, I, think, I mean, increased, increased collaborations between universities and museums is, is probably actually a conversation for another day. Um, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just, <laughs> just getting, getting going. Started. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to, you have to come back for, for the, uh, the uh, other fair in, uh, the next fair in October. <laughs> um, it remains for me, in fact, it remains for me to ask the question that I've just been daydreaming about, which is what are you going to wear for the Met Gala? <laughs> it's, uh, so, Tr um, Tristram Hunt, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I think we can all just spend time dreaming about that also. I think that, that, I think that leaves a, a you know, very strong visual for us. Terrible. Thank you so much for attending. Please come back, join us for other panels throughout next Tuesday morning. Uh, it's been a delight to have both of you here again, and enjoy the fair for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Just get the mic on.